Welcome, everybody, to the Worship Ministry Training Podcast, a monthly podcast for worship leaders and worship team members. My name is Alex, and I am so thrilled that you guys are here today. And um, if you are a new listener on a podcast or on YouTube, I would encourage you to hit subscribe and like it. And uh, the reason for subscribing is so that you can get the monthly updates, because every month we drop a new uh, podcast episode, practical, in-depth training for you and for your worship ministry. And so we want you to stay up to date with all of that. Um, If you are a worship leader who is interested in growing and developing and becoming just a better leader in general, I would encourage you to check out the Worship Ministry Training Academy, which some of the Academy uh, members are already listening live to this podcast interview as it happens. Um, But the Academy is basically 10 in-depth courses that will give you the practical skills that you need to be a great and God-honoring worship leader. You also get live monthly trainings. You get these exclusive podcast interviews live where you can ask your own questions. And then a super awesome, supportive community. You guys know who you are. Um, So if you're looking for community and for growth, check out worshipministrytraining.com. You get free uh, 10-day trial to check things out. So definitely want to encourage you um, to check it out for free. Dive in and say hi inside the Academy. And today I have a new friend uh, that I just met. He's an awesome guy, Mike Yeager on the podcast. And Mike leads the creative teams at Awaken Church, which is a large multi-site church in San Diego. And they are super creative, super innovative. And so that's what we're going to be talking about is using creativity and art to build people up and to build the kingdom of God. And so we're going to be learning how to increase our own church's creativity and how to lead creative teams and build creative teams to accomplish this. Um, And if you are watching live right now within the Academy, um, basically what we're going to do is we're going to have this live interview. And then at the end, we're going to send you a Zoom link and we're all going to jump on a call with Mike and spend about 25 minutes or so, maybe 20 minutes or so asking him our own questions. So as I'm talking to Mike, write your questions down, save your questions, and then we'll send you guys a Zoom link and we'll jump into the conversation together. So that is enough intro. Let me uh, bring on Mike and let's uh, welcome him to the podcast. Mike, hello, welcome. Hey, hey, how are you? I'm good, man. Everybody say hi to Mike. (laughs) Hi, everybody. So Mike, um, thanks for being on, man. I would love it if you would just kind of set the tone by telling us a bit about Awaken Church and your role there, kind of how long you've been there, a little bit of backstory for our listeners. Totally, yeah. So Awaken Church has been around for um, 17 years. It was actually started by um, two missionaries that came from Australia to the United States um, out of a a big church movement called the C3 Movement, which is a a big church movement of, I think, like 500 global churches. And um, so they they, uh, came out of uh, that planted... um, uh, Awakened Church 17 years ago in San Diego and started uh-uh. um, and planted the church and started, you know, with like first service of like 30 people and has just grown and grown and grown from there. My wife and I moved from Dallas, Texas to San Diego so I could do my graduate work in engineering, had no intention of ever being a pastor, didn't go to seminary, um, but uh, just was radically transformed by this church, fell in love with it. Um, my life was um, completely put back together after being a, a total mess. And so we just started serving and um, and then started leading and then um, became campus pastors. We're over the East Lake campus, which is the uh, southernmost campus. Um, we're about 10 minutes away from the Mexican border. And so we lead that campus that has about 1,500 people a week. And then also uh, am the executive over um, all of production and worship and the executive producer and head songwriter for our Awaken Music program where we um, write and produce our own uh, original music. That's insane. So Mike and I were talking before we jumped on the call live and um, just amazing to me how much you juggle, how much you manage. I said we should probably do a whole podcast episode about how you manage all of that, a business and a family and a ministry, and not just a small ministry, but like a heavy duty ministry. So uh, I would love, Mike, for you to tell us more just about the worship arts ministry um, at Awaken Church and meaning not just music because you guys have musicians in production just like most churches, but you also have a graphics team, a photography team, a videography team, and even a dance team. Um, So can you kind of just give us an overview of all of those different creative teams that you guys have there? Yeah, I mean, you you hit on on all of them. So yeah, we're we're, uh, 
very creative forward church. Um, we have a very robust, um, the only one maybe you didn't mention is a very robust theater team. Um, and every year we put on um, two main uh, musical productions, an Easter production that's called Hero the Rock Musical, which is the story of, of the life, death, resurrection of Jesus set to nothing but secular rock and roll music, which is super fun. And then we have um, a, a Christmas uh, theater production called Twisted. Um, and it's the story of Ebenezer Scrooge and how he got so twisted, um, all set to uh, secular 80s music. So it's really cool. We don't, there's actually not a single worship song in any of those. And we take these secular songs and use them to tell um, tell the, the greatest story ever told. So those are, I'd say that those two theater programs are our single biggest outreach tool in the entire church. Every year we have um, tens of thousands of people come and attend those shows that normally wouldn't come to a Sunday or Wednesday church service. They hear the gospel message. And so that's a, a big part of what we do is, um, is, is uh, on the theater side and uh, producing our own orig original music. And then of course, um, uh, video and, and just kind of the some of the normal stuff um from uh, on, on sundays and wednesdays but um yeah and i think for us you know we i think it's in uh daniel chapter one where it talks about um you know king nebuchadnezzar um goes and essentially plunders um the the people of god and, and the bible says that takes all of their their pottery and all their brightest minds and takes um uh uh, Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and essentially pilfers um, the creativity and the art of the kingdom and puts it on display in Babylon. And, and, and the scriptures, Babylon always represents the spirit of, of this world. And we just, I think for us, we've seen so much of that and have just gotten sick of it. I mean, some of the greatest artists in the world, Whitney Houston, Katy Perry, Jessica Simpson, John Legend, all started in church. And sadly, um, have been wooed away by the spirit of the world to, you know, to Babylon and are no longer um, doing the, the work of the kingdom. And so I think for us, we feel like that's a great tragedy and, um, and want to make it right. You know, back in the early Renaissance days, I mean, the, the greatest art in the history of the world was focused on Jesus and the church. Like the greatest paintings ever mm -hmm. were in the house of God and even... Um, I think it's the the Salvador uh, del Mundi is the most expensive painting ever sold, four hundred and fifty million dollars. The mo the single most expensive piece of art is just the face of Jesus. Mm. So there's, um, it's uh, I think a great tragedy that that the greatest art in the world is not being made by the church. And I'm certainly not not going to um, be pretentious and, and say that we are currently making the greatest art in the world. I don't think that's the case. But I think that that the church should aspire to that. I think we shouldn't just say this is good for Christian music or this is good for a church. It should be, this is good period. Mm. This all its own with the greatest art, the greatest music, the greatest theater productions, you know, um, for, for, for us, I mean, we want, and again, we're, it's a big vision and, and we're still figuring it out and certainly not going to say we got it all, all together and figured out, but we want our theater productions to be on par with Broadway. We want our music to not just, you know, compete for, you know, Dove Awards, but to win Grammys. And, um, and again, that's, those are very lofty goals and, um, and who knows, hope one day God will mm. uh, bless us in that way. But the point is, is we just, we feel strongly that as the church, we've got to reclaim the arts to glorify God and not promote a spirit of this world. Mm. Yeah. But what, what I think is cool, uh, Mike, is that in terms of art, it's like art speaks things that a sermon can't. Like you can say things with art and you can uh, reach people's souls with art in a way that you can't with a sermon or even with a worship song. Like uh, art transcends just are just me mental faculties and it just speaks right into the soul. And so I, I love that. I love that point that you're bringing, it, bringing out. And I think one of the things that I wanted to talk to you about, and I, you already started hitting on it, was like, what is the philosophy behind all of these creative teams? Like, why, why are you using art so heavily in the church? And I think you spoke already to some of that, but is there more that you would like to say? No, I think, um, I think that's it. I mean, we, we, don't believe that um, that that the church should be relevant to culture. We think that the church should establish culture, um, and that the church shouldn't be a a thermometer that says, "Hey, here's the temperature of the world outside." It should be a thermostat that dictates the temperature of the the world outside. And so, um, so yeah, I think uh, we're we're passionate about um, about bringing our very best. Um, and you know, when when uh, when King David went to go back and retrieve the Ark of the Covenant, um, it's kind of a crazy story. They throw it on the back of this cart 
and um, just pulling it back to Israel on a cart and then the oxen stumble and, and this guy reaches out to touch it and God kills him on the spot. And it's like, whoa, I mean, that seems like so mean and heavy handed. But the reality is, is, is King David didn't treat the presence of God with the respect um, and the honor that it deserved. And so then he goes back and and does it the right way and has um, priests carry the Ark of the Covenant. He takes a handful of steps. He stops and sacrifices, gives offering, dances with all of his might. Um, and so, you know, the the God deserves our very, very best, our excellence. And not in any kind of weird performance way where it's like God's mad if we go to the wrong chord during a worship song. It's not that, but it's just the attitude of, um, God, we're going to bring you our absolute best. Um, we're going to represent you well, we're your image bearers on the earth. And we want that the image we reflect back to be, um, indicative of who you actually are. Yeah. God's not mad when we hit a bad chord, but the worship leader is <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> just kidding. I'm just kidding. No, none of my people get mad when their team hits a bad chord. Hopefully not. Hopefully not. But no, I hear what you're saying. Like, and I love that. I love that you guys want your art to rival the art of the world. And I did a podcast interview with uh, Andrew Peterson uh, maybe a year ago about creativity. He's a super creative guy, songwriter, but also writes amazing books. And he said the same thing. Like, we should be rivaling the world. We should be better. We should be better than the world because we have a better message than the world does. They have. No, they literally have nothing. All they can sing about is sex and whatever money and we have the gospel the recreation of the cosmos that will happen one day and we should be making great art about that so yes. i'm actually reading a wrinkle in time with my kids i don't know if you've ever read that but it's a very creative book and kind of talks about these cosmic things and i think it's a christian perspective i don't know it's kind of almost on the border of new age but anyway yeah. Uh, but yeah art like art is amazing and and we have such a good message to share um how so just for again our listeners you have you have graphic design team which that's unique you have a photography team um, that is becoming less unique nowadays but i still think it's not a lot of churches are building teams around photographers um you have a videography team so how is this content being used in your church uh whether it's in services or online on social or like how what are you guys doing with all this creativity we know about the the two big outreaches that you do, but what else are you guys doing with all that content? Um, yeah, I think uh, for us, we um, everything at our church is about building our Sunday and Wednesday services. Um, and so I think that that's always a guiding light for us. If the art that we're making is not ultimately building Sundays and Wednesdays, um, then we've kind of lost it a little bit. So like, for example, you know, with the, the awaken music, the original music program, I mean, if, if we are getting songs on the radio and, and, you know, generating revenue and even winning awards, but it's, it's not actually, they're not songs that, that bless our people on a Sunday and Wednesday. Um, and are are kind of songs that have the DNA and culture of our house, then we've kind of missed it a little bit. So everything is peripheral to just building Sundays and Wednesdays. So generally all the things you're talking about in some way build the Sunday, Wednesday experience, whether that's, you know, promotional videos for um, some of our bigger conferences that are coming up or um, testimony videos or, you know, whatever that may be from a video perspective, all the, all the graphics um, are things we use to just um, again, put, put sermon series and, and messages in, in the right light and, and be, be fresh. Um, you know, the, the three kind of, um, biggest attributes of our church from the very beginning, 17 years ago, when our pastor started, started the church where we're, we're going to be a church that's fresh, real, and powerful. And so we want all the visuals to, um, to, uh, to bolster that mission. Mm. Yeah. So specifically like, you know, every all the visuals are bolstering Wednesdays and Sundays. But what about just like, I mean, I'm thinking about photography team. So what do you tell us about that? You, you, you And by the way, I, we should say this, too. It's not all staff members, right? You guys actually develop volunteers and train with volunteers to do the graphic design and, and do the photography and to be parts of the videography thing. So what like tell us a little bit about those teams. Yeah, we're a. Um it's a lot easier when you're when you when your church gets a little bigger um and uh you know there's 
there's some some revenue coming in. It's a lot easier to hire somebody than it is to raise up a volunteer. Um, just kind of throw money at the problem. Hey, let's just we're, we got we got a deficit. Let's just get a new graphic designer. Let's just get a new photographer. Let's just. But um, the the power of self sacrifice and actually inconveniencing yourself for the the building of the house of God that actually unlocks something in the kingdom that actually brings blessing um, to you. And I know that. You know, I know you, you kind of uh, made a joke at the beginning of the show just about all the things that I carry and handle. And it's true. I have, I have a very full and adventurous life. But the I'm you know, I'm, the reality is I'm not burned out. I'm not exhausted. I'm not miserable. I'm actually having the best time. And yes, my life is full and there's weeks that are, you know, more challenging than others. But, um, you know, but the Bible says that he who refreshes others will he himself be refreshed. And so there's actually when we don't. Um, if we as as leaders um, rob people of the opportunity to volunteer, we're um, robbing them of a, an, of a, the unlocking of blessing over their lives because um, light, inconveniencing yourself for the kingdom um, is um, unlocks uh, all kinds of things for you. So we're very heavily run by volunteers for for the church our size. We have a a pretty radically small staff um, and so much of what we do is is volunteer all of our our entire worship team is all volunteer um, all of our uh, awakened music singers and songwriters that spend I mean ridiculous amounts of time writing in the studio um, all of its volunteer so um, we uh, were very 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 heavy on volunteers yeah I think that's important to, to remind our listeners and I'm sure they know this already but just that we are called to not produce something we're called to equip the saints for ministry right it's like we are called to um develop people that is the whole reason we have a job as a worship leader worship director worship pastor is to develop others and so if we're like oh well it has to be like if you're going for perfection over involvement like there's a little bit of a problem yes we want to call people to excellence but we really if we're not involving people in ministry, then we're failing. Like the whole church exists, you know, to bring glory to God by involving the saints in ministry. And so I love that you guys are doing that. Can you tell us a little bit about who leads each of those teams? Obviously it's volunteers that are in the teams, but you probably have staff over each of the teams. Talk about like, what does it look like for uh, the photography team or the graphics team or the production team? Is there a point person? Are they meeting with them? Are they doing trainings with them? Is there a whole collective of creatives that meet together? Just share a little bit about that team structure. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll use the worship team as, as an example because it's pretty robust and has a, a pretty um, uh, built out leadership structure. So, um, and actually surprisingly, um, a lot of the leadership of our worship teams are volunteers as well. So, um, again, we're one church in six different locations. So we have campuses, we have five campuses in San Diego, one in Salt Lake city. We're planting another couple campuses right now. So the church is ever growing. Um, and I think, you know, for a, a growing church, which I mean, you know, uh, hopefully all churches, I mean, you know, it's, it's in, in a perfect world, all churches would be growing. Um, I know it's not always the case and there's different reasons for that. So I don't want to, um, sort of, uh, pile on shame and guilt. If you're a part of a church that's not growing, I mean, there's, there's seasons, but, um, you know, th- what's, what's healthy does grow. And so if your church is growing, then you're always going to be at a deficit of leaders. You're always going to be at a deficit of volunteers. And I think the, sometimes we can get so bent out of shape like we don't have enough drummers we don't have enough guitar players we don't have enough but if the thing that you're shepherding your church is growing then by definition you're never going to have enough because the second you get your arms around it then your church is bigger and you need more le- need more leaders and so it's i think one of the things we've settled into is there's a little bit of, of you just kind of never going to have it all perfectly figured out, have every structure perfect. And you kind of learn to, it's like parenting, you know, you have, if everybody out there that has kids, it's like the, when, you know, when you have a baby, all of a sudden it's like total life change. Everything's different. Oh my gosh. Like went from no kids to, to, to having a kid. And then it's the second you feel like you've kind of got your arms around that, then it's something different. They're crawling and now you got to baby proof the whole house. And, and then the minute you get your hands around that, then they're talking. And so, 
there's always a little bit of, of kind of constant adaptation when the thing that you're working with is growing. And so as, um, so that's, that's one thing is we just kind of understand that there's always going to be a little bit of like, we're trying to catch up. Um, but at each of our campuses, we have worship teams, robust worship teams at every campus, um, that operate at a campus level, but they have to have a standard of excellence. They, they have to have the culture of our church. They're not just kind of rogue factions that are doing their own thing. And so we have appointed and raised up and elevated what we call campus worship directors at every campus. And that's a volunteer position. It's a very weighty, um, a lot of responsibility. It's a big position um, to be volunteer. But again, we we believe in the raising up and empowering of leaders. And so those campus worship directors are responsible for the worship execution and ultimately the health of the team. I'd say the for us, and you, you alluded to it, Alex, and I think you're, you're dead on, if a, a, churches are always going to run into the temptation to become an organization of servants instead of a house of sons and daughters. Mm -hmm. And we um, are a house of sons and daughters first. Um, and if, and, and if we ever slip into viewing people as commodities, like all you are to me is somebody who can play guitar really well. And I don't really care about how your marriage is doing. And I don't really care about your personal struggles. Then the, the things will unravel very, very, very quickly. And so we are, um, our, the number one role of our leadership is to make sure that the team is healthy outside of whatever, you know, task we, we ask them to do and weight we ask them to carry at church. And so our campus worship directors ensure that there's culture in the team, there's health in the team, that there's excellence in the team. That's a volunteer position. And then they run what we call development nights every single month at their specific campus. And that's where we work on technical execution. We build community. We have a little impartation of culture. And then, um, you know, I, uh, I meet and I have a kind of a, a right hand armor bearer that um, is, is an amazing guy. And it's our job to lead the campus worship directors and make sure that they feel um, uh, empowered. They feel seen that they can escalate challenges that they're seeing at their campus. And we provide um, strategy and guidance um, at sort of a, a centralized headquarters level, if you will. But it's, it's exactly like what you see in um, in the Exodus with um, Moses getting the Israelites out into the desert where he goes to Jethro, um, his his father-in-law and he's like, Hey man, you're going to, you're wearing yourself out. You got to raise up, um, you know, people that can oversee people that oversee people. And so, um, we, we take that, um, take that to heart and, and really believe in the raising up and empowering of leaders to make sure that people are taken care of all the way down. Mm, that's so good. And how often are you meeting with your worship directors? Yeah, we have a, a 30 minute touch point. Um, every week just at what we call a cadence call and it's oper it's operational in nature i'd say the first maybe 10 minutes of that is a little cultural impartation just hey guys let's make sure we're focused on you know whatever it may be um but then it's that's more operational um give give the team a chance to e escalate things upward i think it's um it's really frustrating for team members when they feel like legitimate issues that they're seeing they can't get heard by people kind of higher up the chain if you will so we make weekly space for people to execute or uh, i'm sorry to escalate um things like that so we meet uh weekly um in that capacity and then uh once every probably two months we have uh team-wide meetings where we get everybody together every volunteer every staff member of the worship team i'm there Generally, I'll, I'll speak for 20 minutes or so. We'll have an extended worship set where we just get to worship together and then go over a couple of tactical things. So, um, you know, I think it's you can also um, over over meet and try to over structure. Well, you got to remember, I mean, at least for us and again, maybe other churches are set up different, but all of our people are volunteers. They've got families, they've got kids that and if we have like you know, a core team meeting, a rehearsal, a develop night, a team night, a culture night, then Sundays, then Wednesdays, that can lead to burnout pretty quick. And so I think we, um, we try to be very strategic with the extra nights of the week that we ask people to meet. And when we do meet, we make sure that they're very powerful, that they're very, um, direct, they're executed. Well, we, it would be, um, I would be pretty upset if we had a, a team night where people just kind of showed up and didn't really know who was leading the night and, Oh, Hey, you know, Mike, do you want to come up and like, those are very organized. Mm -hmm. um, we, we want our people to see that when we ask you to, to give us a night of the week, we honor your time. We end on time. We start on time. So yeah, does that answer your question a little bit? Yeah, totally. And maybe just talk a little bit more about that monthly 
training because I, I've talked to a few worship leaders who are considering something like that. Um, that's on the campus level. What does that look like? You said some impartation of culture, some uh, development of skill. So are they actually like playing through a few new songs or? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So those are those are generally the nights where we work through new music that we're going to introduce to the congregation. So typically we're on a cadence of introducing two new songs a month. It's not always um, an exact science. And sometimes that's songs from another church. Sometimes that's original music that we we are writing. And that's exactly right. We you know, we don't want the the very first time the congregation hears a new song to be the worship team just kind of got got their feet wet on it. The rehearsal 30 minutes beforehand. So. Right those monthly um, campus level develop nights will be generally a short kind of cultural impartation, working through new songs, building chemistry as a team, because um, you just can't replace um, just the the chemistry that's developed by repetition and just actually playing together. Mm -hmm. And so there's a balance of, again, we don't want to have rehearsals like, hey, can you all show up at 4.30 in the morning on Sunday? Um, you know, that's a little egregious, but we also do want, do recognize that excellence is built through um, the the building of chemistry in the team. So, um, so yeah, that's that's typically how those um, those monthly campus uh, nights are run. Yeah, that's helpful. Um, just a couple questions about leading creatives. Like, how do you keep, or what have you found keeps creatives motivated? That's a great question. I, I, maybe I'll answer it by answering the converse question, which is what demotivates um, creatives. And I think, uh, and again, I, I don't. I say this humbly and, and certainly not like we've got it all figured out um, and still have a million things to learn. So I'm not saying that the way we do it is the right way. It's just mm -hmm. our way. Um, but we have found that when the creative teams silo themselves and, and it's easy to do. So I think one of the things that we see is when creative teams silo themselves and it's very easy to do because it generally at churches, the, the worship teams and the production teams, they're very demanding. They're very demanding teams. Typically, they're the first ones there, the last ones to leave. They've got more, um, you know, they've got time outside of church where they need to learn music, et cetera, et cetera. And so I think it's easy sometimes for those teams to sort of like nobody else gets us. It's just kind of us. We, we get what's going on. So one of the things that we and, and that can really lead to a lot of dysfunction where the, the core values of the church actually depart from the core values of, of the worship team. Or I, I, I should say that the core values of the worship team depart from the core values of the church. And so the way to combat that we have found is to make sure that your worship teams, your creative teams, your whatever teams that they're involved involved in church outside of just those teams. Mm. So we have, you know, one of the backbones of our church is we have weekly men's and women's prayer meetings, and they're the most important things that we do. And so we really strongly encourage, hey, if you want to be a part of our worship team, um, we really would like for you to go to our men's prayer meetings. We would love for you to be in a connect group and not a, not a creative connect group. If you're, um, you know, young family, go find a young family connect group that doesn't have um, creatives in it necessarily. And so really, we push our creative team to be involved in the church, not just the creative team of the church. Mm, I think that's, yeah, that's yeah. huge. I, I remember, uh, who was I interviewing? But they said something very similar. They're like, if the worship team is the on only group that your people are uh, involved with, um, then you're asking your worship team to fulfill all these things for that person that it isn't, isn't designed to fulfill and it can't uh, bear that weight, you know, and um, I was like, oh my gosh, that is so genius. And what you're saying is the same thing. It's like they have to be connected to the larger church body and find their identity there. And then the serving is just the outlet where they serve. Exactly. Yep. Yep. You've got it. Yeah. That's huge. Now, one more question about uh, leading creatives. Like a lot of times creatives want to focus on the creativity, the music, the art, the production, the whatever. How do you guys try to steer their hearts back to Jesus, 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 you know, focusing on Christ rather than creativity. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's, it, there's not a lot of try to it. It's just kind of a, you got to do it. And that's, and you're right. Um, you know, we, it's, we, and it's, it's, um, you know, the, the greatest athletes in the world are the greatest athletes in the world because they've mastered the fundamentals. And so I think it can be a little bit of a, of a, a lie that, why do we keep having to go back and teach these basic principles over and over again? And it's like, well, those are fundamentals and, and the masters of their craft have mastered the fundamentals. And so for us, the fund, one of the fundamentals is 
you serving on the team is not about you. It's about the vision of the house and ultimately the the spreading of the, of the gospel message. And so if you may have the, the sickest guitar part in the world with a guitar tone that is going to cause people to melt and worship. But if, if that is taking away ultimately from, from the overarching, um, you know, theme of the service and what God's trying to do in the service, then sorry, like don't care about your, your super awesome guitar tone. And I think it's just a, you know, I said that very harshly and you know, we, we say it a little more delicately, but I think it, it is just a, a reminder like, Hey guys, um, and we have, so we do when every rehearsal starts for every Sunday or Wednesday service, we have, everybody does their line check and make sure their in-ear levels are good. And there's just kind of some logistics there, but then, um, we have a, a pre-huddle moment and those pre-huddle moments always start with a moment that we call it not just another service. And it's where we remind ourselves that for us, this is just another service. It's another Sunday. We do this every week. But this could be the Sunday where there's a guy coming in and his mom has been praying for him for 35 years. And this is the Sunday where he's finally said, you know what, I'm going to go to church today. And so we try to remind ourselves of the stakes that that there's there's a lot at stake and not in a weird like pressure performance way, but like there's real eternal implications mm-hmm. on the line here. There's legacies that can be built and destinies that can be shifted. And so um, it's just that constant reminder. It, you're never going to get away from it. Um, and it's, and it's not a, it's not a bad thing. I mean, of course, creative people are going to want to be creative and that's how God wired them and they should want to be creative. But, but we also all need to be reminded always myself included that I'm a part of something bigger than myself. And as, as, as great and as talented as, as Alex is, or as great and as talented as Mike is or whoever, like if, if I just move to Tahiti tomorrow and decide to forsake my faith and like Christianity is going to be just fine without me. Mm-hmm. It's a lot bigger than me. God will raise up somebody else and, and things will be fine. And I think that's a good, healthy reminder that, um, and it actually, it may feel like you're not needed. You're not, but that's actually not it. It's actually tremendously freeing because you're like, wow, this does not depend on me. I'm invited to be a part of it. How beautiful is that? So there's not a weird weight on you. Like if I don't, if I, if I screw this up, then, you know, the whole world falls apart. It's, it's not that God's sovereign, but he invites you on a divine partnership to be a part of the, the telling of the greatest story ever told. So I think that kind of constant, and it has to be a constant reminder. We do it every single service. Mm-hmm. Um, if you let, you know, it's that old analogy. If, if something's three degrees off, it's not that far off. But if, if you're three degrees off flying from San Diego to New York, you'll end up in like North Carolina or something, mm-hmm. you know. So um, over long distances, those little deviations um, produce pretty massive, massive course corrections. They're a lot harder to correct when your team has like totally gone off the rails than when you just kind of um, have, have these very subtle touch points um, at, a, at a very regular cadence. Totally. Mike, so huge. And for everybody listening or watching, like – reminding at the start of every service like why we do this what we do is so critical like you said to just keeping our hearts in the right place and then even i don't know if you do this but i'm sure you do like you get like a little message from someone in the congregation this happened because of the worship or this happened in the sermon or this happened today or these people got saved or you know whatever little stories you pass those on to the team to like wow what i do is changing people's lives wow what i do god is using so i think that is such a great reminder for us to be reminding our team so thank you for that mike of course i'd love to uh, just wrap it up talking about creativity you guys are writing songs you're recording music so i'd love for you to share just about the awaken worship and awaken music stuff that you guys are doing uh some of the new projects that you've released in 2021 2022 you've released a couple singles uh tell our listeners about those where they can stream those where they can find those what it's called so yeah just share a little bit about that yeah yeah you can find any any major streaming platform spotify apple music um uh amazon youtube but just uh search awaken music so we released a a six song uh project that was later released a, a deluxe version with an additional track um called lionheart and that project came out I think July of last year, and then the deluxe version came out maybe in October. 
And then um, we are um, just a few days away from the release of our uh, full length project called Move of Heaven. Cool. Yeah. So all streaming platforms on, on YouTube, we have original music videos um, done up. So yeah, yeah just uh, very proud of the music and feel like it carries um, the, the DNA and culture of, of our house. So certainly would love for listeners to check it out. Totally. And I'll put links in the show notes and then the YouTube description and all that so that they can easily just click and listen to your beautiful music. I've listened to it. It's really good. It's really high quality. It's not cheesy. It's not cliche. It's very, very good. So uh, I would encourage the listeners to check that out. Now we're uh, going to move now into our Q&A time with some of our live uh, Academy members. And um, But before we leave, Mike, are there any final words you want to leave for the podcast listeners, the YouTube viewers, just encouragement about worship ministry in general or specifically create it, creativity, creative teams, anything just final encouragement and exhortation? Yeah, I just I would say what you guys are doing really matters. Um, and again, I, there's there's um, a lot at stake, and um, and what we're doing matters. And, and there's um, if the church, if 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 your city that your church is in is not different because of your church, then you know I'd say you need to need to reevaluate what you're doing. If if the divorce rate in San Diego doesn't go down because Awakened Church is there. Then we need to reevaluate what we're, what we're doing, and and so I think um, as a creative team, as a worship team, um, we have the great honor and privilege of creating an atmosphere and an environment where the transformative power of God can move in power and strength. And you know, power. I'm an engineer. Power is work per unit time, which means getting a lot of work done really, really fast. That's what power actually is by by definition. And so when people come into your services, it may be decades of dysfunction that God can undo in an instant. And we get the privilege of creating that environment. So I just think that um, I know it can be it can be hard. It can be a grind sometimes. But when you remind yourself of the the privilege of doing what we're doing, the what's at stake, I think um, it just makes it makes it a joy and makes it exciting. And just want to honor you, Alex, for what you're doing. I think what you're doing is amazing and such a great guy and, and uh, have said yes to such an important, um, important thing. So appreciate you having me on. It's been a lot of fun. Thanks, Inspired. Mike. Thank you. But for everybody, uh, listening uh, after the fact or watching on YouTube. Um, thanks. Please like and subscribe and uh, we'll see you next month for another helpful episode. If you are watching live in the Academy, I'm going to send a Zoom link right now to Mike and to you guys and we can ask uh, our own questions. You guys can ask your own questions to him there. But God bless you guys and have a great month. I'll see you next month for another helpful episode.